when, well, while I'm saying this, if you need a Bible, go get a Bible. Okay. So, when we dismiss for echo groups, I need y'all to come back in here and clean up. Because, like, the last several Wednesdays, it's been a dump in here. For those of you who aren't taking notes on the sheets, that's fine, but you're crumpling up and throwing them in the ground. Bibles are left everywhere. Water bottles are left in here. Cups are left in here. We've got to clean that stuff up. Okay? So, um, help me clean up. Also, I did a quick head count while we were singing, and there are 43 individuals in this room right now, and only 23 have signed in on the iPad. So, when you leave, go and check if you have signed in on the iPad, please. That's a good way for us to kind of track how we're doing and where people are, and that, that's the way I know who I need to follow up with. So, if that number's not right, that kind of does me a disadvantage. So, please, please do that. All right. With all that out of the way, today we are going to be going into Genesis chapter 42. And I told you all at the beginning, we're, we're seven pieces, seven, we're on the seventh part of this journey through Joseph's story. And I told you at the beginning that Joseph's story has everything you could possibly want for like a prime time television show. It has drama. It has like... Uh, violence. It has like sexual intrigue with Potiphar's wife. It has all of this stuff going on that would just it make an epic story. And tonight is one of these moments that is just so full of irony and fascinating conversations that if we just kind of skim over it, you don't realize until we start getting into it. So, with that being said, when we last left our story, we were talking a lot about God's faithfulness to Joseph, how God had continuously been faithful to Joseph to move him into the places where he needed him to be. He's constantly been there for Joseph, provided for Joseph, regardless of what the situation looked like. And in the last chapter, Joseph has gone in one day from a prisoner to the second in control of Egypt that fast, in one day. And also in the last chapter, we cover how Joseph gets married to an Egyptian woman. He's given a new name. He has two children, and he becomes incredibly wealthy and powerful in the land of Egypt. And God's faithful providence has elevated Joseph to a level that would have been unimaginable to him 20 years prior. But that's where we are in this story. We have come 20 years into the future. But there's one thing that still hasn't happened in Joseph's story. God's been faithful. He's been given the power. He's been given money. He's been delivered. But we still have these two dreams that started this whole thing, right? The dreams that he told his brothers and then his family that got him attacked by them. Those dreams are still hanging out there in the air, and there hasn't been a conclusion to those dreams. Well, we start to see that conclusion today. So, another thing we see is the long-term effects of sin on the sinner and on the victim of sin. And that's why I say this is a fascinating, just literary piece. If you just slow down and read this section, it's absolutely fascinating. So, I'm going to read it all in one chunk, and then we're going to break it down, okay? So, 42 verses 1 through 25, and then we'll come back and we'll break it into smaller pieces. When Jacob learned that there was, a, was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you sit here and look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So, ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin Joseph's brother were his brothers with his brothers, for he feared what that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came from the famine was great in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor in the land, and he was the one who sold to all the people the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces in the ground. And Joseph saw his brothers, and recognized them, but, they, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where have you come from? And they said, we have come from the land of Canaan to buy food. 
And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them, and he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. He said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, and the son of one man in Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, but one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I have said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, and let him bring your brother while, the, while you remain confined, so that your words can be tested whether there is truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put all of them in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households. And bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. But they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, that we saw the distress of his soul, and he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them, and he wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and replace every man's money in his sack to give them provisions for the journey. And this was done for them. Okay, this is such a fascinating chunk of text. I mean, it, it's like you could pull this out of a literary novel like The Count of Monte Cristo. This is absolutely fascinating. So first... When we start this journey, the first several verses, we cut. If you look to the previous chapter, Joseph is like, if you kind of think of this as a movie, which is a way that I did, you know how movies will just like, sometimes you'll be in one place and all of a sudden you cut to like the exact opposite situation? It's kind of what you have. You have Joseph, rich, powerful. Things are going great for him in Egypt. Then like there's a hard cut to like Jacob and his sons in Canaan starving. And that's where we start our section of the story. Things are not going very well for them in Canaan as things are going in Egypt for Joseph. And this famine that Joseph had predicted has come, and it is ravaging the lands surrounding Egypt, including Canaan. And it seems that after a couple of years of eating all of their reserves, because it would have been common for them to hold back some food, after a couple of years of eating all of their reserves, they kind of look around and say, hey, uh, we don't have any more food and we're going to die. Okay. Not a great place to be, just on a basic level, right? I don't know about you, but I don't want to starve to death. And apparently neither did Jacob. Um, and what's interesting is what Israel says to his sons. Because note this. He says, when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you sit here and look at one another? It's kind of this question like, what are you guys doing? Like, apparently, they were just kind of sitting around and complaining about it. And Jacob's like, hey, you know, complaining doesn't fill my belly. I'd rather not starve to death. Why don't you go do something about it? So it's kind of a very interesting question as to what exactly they're doing, but apparently it was not enough. And it's also interesting to see that the fact that grain was for sale in Egypt was widely enough known because Jacob knew about it and... When these, bo when these ten brothers are sent, they join a caravan that is already en route to Egypt. So this was a well-known thing that Joseph had made a name for himself and made a name for the land of Egypt as a place where they could go and get the food that they needed. Another interesting thing is, who doesn't get sent? Benjamin. Now, what do Benjamin and Joseph have in common? They are both Rachel's sons. And it seems that Israel, or Jacob, hasn't learned his lesson. and He's still playing favorites. 
And why this is uniquely interesting to me is that why did they kill Joseph? Because they were jealous. Because they were tired of him being dad's favorite. But guess what? Getting rid of Joseph didn't solve their problem. It just transferred their problem to a new individual. And that's a very interesting kind of statement on what sin does to us, right? Sin will typically promise us that if we commit this sin or do this thing, it will solve a problem for us. But in actuality, what happens is it simply transfers the problem and damages us. And that's what we see here. Their sin against Joseph did not solve their problem. And so the brothers head to Egypt. And this is about a 250 to 300 mile journey. Okay, So this is, this is a little bit of a jaunt. It's going to be about three weeks one way for them. Okay, Verses 6 through 8, it says, Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came to him and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. As his brothers come down from Canaan, and they make this three-week-long, 300-mile journey into Egypt, God moves in such a way to ensure that these brothers are reunited. Because we know from earlier in the text that Joseph is moving around. right? He is the one who goes and goes from place to place to place, ensuring that the grain is there. We see this because it says... He went to the city and put all of the food from the surrounding areas into that city. So he goes around. He's kind of a more or less quality assurance guy at this point. He goes from place to place to check in on things. And it just so happens that he's at the place where they show up at to buy food. And there's Joseph. They, they show up and they are told, hey, it is y'all's lucky day. You're never going to guess who's here. It, the, the second in command of all of Egypt is here. The second in command of all of Egypt. His name is his royal governor, Zapanath Panea. And he's going to oversee your request. They have no idea who Zapanath Panea is. He doesn't look like anybody they've ever seen before. He doesn't have his beard. He's been shaven. He's wearing the finest Egyptian clothing and has all the pomp and circumstance surrounding him that you would expect from somebody who's in second, second in command of such a powerful, powerful nation. And of course, the customary response in the ancient Near East to somebody with this much power and authority is that you bow yourselves to them. And so these ten brothers fall on their face and bow before this governor, Zapanath Panea. Thus fulfilling the prophecy from Genesis chapter 37. If you flip back to Genesis chapter 37, Genesis 37 verses 6 and 7, he says, And he said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to mine. His brother said to him, Are you indeed going to reign over us? Are you indeed going to rule over us? And they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then 20 years later, here we are. And I love the imagery here, because even in the dreams, all of the brothers are personified as sheaves of grain. And what are they here to buy? Grain. And they all come 
and they bow to Joseph. But more than just physically bowing out as a sign of respect, this bowing and submission to Joseph is a complete 180 degree turn from where they were when they last met him. When they last saw Zapath Panea, they beat him. They threw him down a 35 foot well and left him to die. Then decided to pull him up out of the well and sell him into slavery. And it was there that he begged for mercy from them. Please don't kill me. I'm sorry. And they laughed at him. And they sat and they ate while he begged for mercy. That's the last time they saw him. And here we are. Now they have come to Joseph to beg because if he does not help them, they will starve to death. The irony in this, and this is, it gets even weirder from here, even crazier from here. The irony in this, how the tables have turned for these brothers. And it says that Joseph spoke roughly to them. Now, him speaking roughly to them is part of an act that we're going to see start to develop here in the next little bit. But I also imagine there's a lot of emotion with this as well. Can you imagine what it must have felt like for Joseph to see these men again? The last time he saw them, they were trying to exterminate him from existence. The last words he would have heard from their lips were mocking laughter as he was drug away into slavery. The last time he would have felt their touch would have been when their fists and feet hit him in the face and in the ribs. And here they are, and they come to beg for food. I cannot imagine the amount of emotion that would be built up in me at this moment. There would be great joy. Hey, he's seeing God do exactly what God promised to do. There would be this miraculous feeling because he realizes, hey, Benjamin and my dad are still alive. But I also have to imagine there would be a lot of pain and anger as well. And all of that kind of starts to show up as these people who had no mercy on him now come to him and beg for mercy. But we see that Joseph rolls out a plan here in the next little bit. As you go for um, 9 through 20, it says this, And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, You are spies, and you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord, we are servants here to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. And he said to them, No, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest this day is with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I have said to you, you are spies, and by this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, if you shall go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here, send one of you and let them bring your brother while you remain confined so that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. Or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. And on the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined here where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of the households. And bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. It's really interesting to watch what Joseph is doing. Do you think he thinks his brothers are spies? 
No, he knows they're not spies. He knows they're not spies. He knows who they are. What we see, starting in chapter 42, verse 9, and going through the end of chapter 44 of Genesis, is a laid-out plan that Joseph does to test his brothers. And what is he testing them for? He wants to see if the past 20 years has changed them as much as it has changed him. He wants to see if they are the same men that sold him into slavery. And the first part of that plan is ensuring that his baby brother Benjamin is still alive. Because Joseph is no fool. He knows that he was his father's favorite because, well, let me ask you, why was he his father's favorite? Right, he came from Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And there's only one other boy who comes from Rachel, and it's Benjamin. So it's logical to conclude that if Joseph is out of the picture, dad's going to start doting on Benjamin. And we've seen what these ten are capable of doing to brothers who get more attention than they do. So for Joseph, step one, before I do anything for these men, is to make sure that Benjamin is still alive. And he accuses them, when, when he accuses them of wanting to see the nakedness of the land, what he's saying is that you are men who are wanting to come and spy to see if Egypt is weak enough to attack, if the famine has decapitated our ability to defend ourselves. That's what he's saying. That's what he's accusing them of. And I love their response. Look at verse 11. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. If I had to describe these ten men, honest would not be anywhere near the top of the category. Think of that. What have we been talking about? They beat their brother, threw him in a pit, decided to sell him for pennies, and then told their dad he got killed by a wild animal. These are not honest men. It's a fascinating, fascinating claim on their part. Why would they say that? How could Joseph keep a straight face? I would not have been able. Can you imagine that? Like if you're in Joseph's shoes, he's like, hey, you're spies. Like, no, we're honest people. We're good guys. We're pretty good. Right, like you, you guys can't even believe your siblings are honest or good people when they tick you off. Now, what if they tried to kill you, and then you see them after like a couple days, like, we're, you know, we're, we're like best friends, we're good people. And you're like, no, you're not. You attempted to murder me. At the very least, you were literally human traffickers. You are not good people. But that's their claim. I don't know if they're just completely oblivious to their own sin, or they're just so desperate to get out of like being killed for being spies, they'll say anything. But it's another amazing example of how the tables have turned again. I mean, the irony of this conversation is so amazing. And so then we move on to, in my opinion, the most powerful part of this interaction in verses 21 through 25. Then they said to one another, the brothers, the brother said, Jackson, you with me? The brother said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our youngest brother. Oh, hold on, wait. Yeah, we are, we are in truth guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you to not sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. And when he turned away, he wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them, and he bound him before their eyes. 
And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and replace every man's money in, its, in his sack. And he gave them provisions for their journey. And this was done for them. So we spent a lot of time thinking about Joseph and how Joseph must have felt. But how about these brothers? These brothers have been brought before the, most power, the second most powerful man in the world. And they want food. That's all they're here for. And he's like, you're spies, and I'm going to kill you. Right? Do you know what? Just kind of a free piece of inf- historical information. The worst punishment in the world is for spies and traitors. Okay? That, that's just a general rule. Okay? So this was not like a light thing. Like, we're going to come up with some terrible way to kill you. And they're immediately like, whoa, 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 man, that's not, we just want food. He's like, no. They, they, try, they deny it four times. He's like, no, I am 1,000% convinced you're spies and you're going to die. And it's going to be pretty bad. So who knows what I can come up with. So they're terrified. Imagine the fear. I mean, heck, dude, I used to get scared when I got sent to the principal's office. Right? These people are about to get murdered. Okay? Like thrown in a dungeon, like skinned alive. Okay? Not going to be fun. And so they're begging for mercy. We didn't do it. Look, we're honest men. We're good people. Okay? I mean, okay, we sold a guy into slavery one time. He was our brother. But don't, other than that, super good people. And Judah may or may not have, like, accidentally had sex with his own daughter-in-law, but that's a different thing. Like, they're, right? But other than that, we're good people. And Simeon may or may not have killed an entire town of people because he got angry about it. But other than that, we're good people. Right? This is all their track record. I'm not making any of this up. Go, 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 look, at, go look at the back part of Genius. These guys are wild. Okay? But we're good. And he makes a deal. He actually shows them a lot of mercy here because if you notice in the beginning, he says, I'm going to keep ten, nine of you and one of you will go back. Well, that's a certain way to get that guy killed because bandits lived all over these roads and they just waited for individuals to come by and they'd kill him. And so then after three days of them being in prison, he goes, okay, I'll keep one and send nine. That way you have a chance to get back. Because I want, I want to see Benjamin. He, he doesn't say that to them, but that's the, that's the, we know that. He needs to see Benjamin to make sure that they're alive, or that he's alive. And so after this, they're falsely accused. They're terrified. Like, hey, we're about to die. And where do they go? When, when a lot of pressure's on you, the truth will come out. And it's fascinating that the place that they go to, all of them, because it says, together, they said, then they said to one another, in truth we are guilty concerning our brother, that we saw the distress of his soul, and when he begged us, we did not listen. Why is that where they go? Remember, they think Joseph's dead, so they have no idea who they're talking to. Why is that the place that they go? That doesn't make any sense. Makes no sense to go there. Narratively, the fact that they say this to one another and the fact that this is the place that they go tells me that they have a lot of shame and guilt that they're living with. I mentioned earlier that the sin that they committed against Joseph did not solve their problem. It, it merely transferred the problem from Joseph to Benjamin. And I said that sin will never improve your situation, but what's true is that sin will always make your situation worse. Not only did the problem that they had with Joseph merely get transferred to Benjamin, now they have sin guilt on them that they have to deal with. They have this mark upon their heart. And it appears after 20 years, which is longer than most everyone in this room has been alive, what they did to their brother still haunts them. Look at at how detailed it is. 
we are guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul, and he begged us, and we did not listen. That's specific. That's actually much more specific than what we get when the thing actually happens. They fill in gaps. If you remember when I preached on that, I had to jump forward to explain part of what happened because they fill in gaps for us because of how specific and vivid their memory is of this. And that's where they go. And let me tell you something. As somebody, me personally, who has sinned plenty of times in my life, and some of, some of them grievous sins. I know what it feels like to be haunted by the things that I've said and by the things that I've done. And, and I would be willing to venture a pretty solid guess that I am not the only person in this room who has that feeling. I know that we are all haunted by things that we've done, by sins that we have committed. Because sin makes a mark on your heart. And we tend to sit and we replay our sin over and over and over, wishing we could have done it differently. And it seems that that's exactly what these brothers have been doing for a very long time. Desperately wishing they could have done something differently. Or at least feeling guilty about what they've done. You know, I, I know an individual, and, and she just kind of popped into my mind as I was writing this today, but I know an individual who, who committed a, a very grievous sin once in her life. And she now, every time something happens to her, she's reminded of her guilt and is convinced that it's God punishing her for what she's done. And that seems to be where these brothers are. Because she, and this, this woman, feels so much guilt for what she did that she constantly brings it back up to herself when things go wrong. And that seems to be what's happened here. But not only does this sin leave a searing, painful mark on the heart of them, of the people who committed the sin, it leaves a searing mark on the victim of the sin. Joseph is brought to tears as he remembers. Because what's happened here is all this time, as Zapath Panea, he has been speaking through a translator, pretending he cannot understand them. But he is fluent in Hebrew. He spoke it as his only language for the first 17 years of his life. He knows everything they're saying to one another without the translator. And so when they turn, the, the kind of connotation you get is that when he says, I'll send one, or I'll send nine, I'll keep one, they turn and have an internal conversation amongst themselves, saying, this is because of what we did to Joseph. And then Reuben, being a know-it-all, like, yeah, I told you not to, even though he really didn't. He just said, don't kill him, just sell him, but whatever. And Joseph hears all of it. And Joseph is brought to remember what happened to him. After all the power, after all the fame, after everything that Joseph has been given by God, the mark of the sin that was committed against him is still searingly painful for him. We see as he breaks down into tears... Because, they're, because of the, the level of betrayal of your brothers attempting to murder you. And I think that in the same way that most of us, I would think probably all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, can relate to the feeling of feeling very, very guilty for sins that we have committed in the past and the pain that comes from that. In the same way, we also know and feel the pain of sin committed against us. And when that is recounted to us, we are reminded of the things 
that have been done to us, whatever that may be. And so we are all this weird mix of sinner and victim of sin, all mixed up. And with each one of these moments, our heart is just further damaged by sin. Sin's one of those weird two-way poisons, two-way weapons that every time you use it, it hurts you as well. And every time someone does it to you, it hurts you. And our, our hearts as sinners, as people who are fallen, feel this constant tug to remind us of the pain that has been inflicted on us and the desire to sin. And into all of that, steps the beauty of the gospel. That through all of this pain, through all of that ache, through all of those marks left on our heart, the same God that providentially moved Joseph to Egypt, the same God that providentially moved these ten brothers to meet Joseph in Egypt, is the same God who providentially moved you to a place where you can be forgiven. It is the same God who in His grace stepped down out of heaven to heal the consequences of our sin. The, the scars of sin that I described that are metaphorically on our heart were literally transposed to the body of this God so that we could be freed from this sin. And in the same way that Joseph here shows mercy on the brothers who did him wrong, so Christ shows mercy to each one of us who helped drive the nails through his hands. Because keep in mind, right, Joseph is a type of Christ. He's pointing us forward to Jesus. And this is just another way that when he has the opportunity, he could have killed these ten and no one would have thought twice about it. No problem. Potiphar was a much lower level man than Joseph was, and he got away with just throwing people in prison whenever he wanted to. Joseph could have killed these people. No one would have asked him a question. But he shows mercy. Because he senses that they are repentant. And in their repentance, he shows grace. In the same way that Christ has shown grace to each one of us. The freedom of the gospel and the way the gospel is so profoundly here in this text is that in, you don't have to be the brothers who are constantly living in condemnation from themselves because of the sins that they committed. They live every day remembering what they did. And Christ takes that away. And in the other instance, Christ's grace also comes in and removes from us the damage done. He lifts us up and makes us a new creation in Him. And in the same way that He moved providentially to make Joseph be in the places that He needed him to be, to move the brothers away from starvation and towards restoration, he providentially moves in the lives of each one of us to bring us to Him and to move us towards the coming restoration when He comes again. And that is our great hope. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank You that You are a God of grace, that You are a God of mercy, that You are a God who loves us absolutely unconditionally once we are yours, Lord. God, we thank you for mercy. 
God, we thank you that we don't have to permanently live in our brokenness. God, we thank you that you look upon the shattered hearts of your children. And with a smiling face, you pick us up and say that we're worth it to you. God, that you can forgive us for our sins against you. Lord, I pray that each one of the individuals in this room, if they do not already know you, God, that you will impress upon them and convict them of their need for you. That you are the one who comes and makes all things new. God, I ask that you would help each one of us to live out the salvation that you have started in us. And show us the way to give the forgiveness that we have so richly been given. God, we ask all of these things in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before you go, I want you to look at your chair and the chairs next to you and pick up any trash. I don't want to, I don't want to have to pick up trash. Also, Everyone, on your way to Echo Groups, on your way to Echo Groups, I want you to run by and check if you signed in, because there's 20 of you who have not, so everyone go check. All right, be good.